Okay, I think we are now live. How is everybody doing? Can you hear me, I guess, is the first usual question. Is my sound working? Do I have audio on your guys' end? Got to make sure. There's usually some issue related to that. Hello there, Devin. Hello, Emil. And you say it's working? All right. Fantastic. All right, Shen Partey, welcome to the party. Boy, this uh, this this stream was a little a little timing coming. Uh, I was originally supposed to uh, put the stream, do the stream on Thursday, but uh, a last minute thing came up in the schedule, so I had to postpone it. And then Friday, I uh, had technical difficulties, and so needed to postpone it. You know, it was like I I was having trouble with OBS on Friday, and it wasn't like picking up my uh, webcam or mic, so I had to fix that. Resolved that Saturday morning, but then somebody came into town that I hadn't seen in a while, and so I needed to, you know, spend time with them, and so I had to delay it once more. And so now it is Sunday night, January 29th, and the stream is finally here. So welcome, everybody. How has your new year been treating you so far? Let's see. The Just Definer asks, Do you think you will ever do a video on how Social Security costs keep increasing? About half of federal spending is based on Social Security and Medicaid Medicare. Uh, yes, it's true. Uh, the... Uh, Medicaid, Medicare, Social Security, and other entitlement programs are the largest single expenditure in the federal government. It outpaces military spending, and it has for some time. I made a video about this a while ago, though not necessarily about that. Like, uh, back in 2018, I made a video about, you know, is Social Security a Ponzi scheme? In which I basically say, in the most technical sense, no, but it also had a lot of the same uh, structural weaknesses as a uh, Ponzi scheme. So, yeah, it's like, I've thought about doing something with Social Security, but I just don't know if there's going to be a huge audience for it. That's kind of the issue here. It's why I've done, it's one of the reasons I have done a lot of like international relations stuff in the last year. It's because like I enjoy doing that and I'm pretty sure there's a larger audience for stuff about that, especially if that international relations involves the Middle East and especially Israel. Then there are interest in people, you know, talking about the uh, shortcomings of Social Security, Medicaid and Medicare. So, yeah, I'm not opposed to the idea. I'm just not entirely certain if it's something that would perform well. Yep. Hello, Six Zappy Beef. Uh, I guess you also ask, uh, do you think the recent drone attack in Iran was from Israel? See, if by recent do you mean today, I haven't paid close attention to that event. I'm not familiar with a drone attack in Iran. But uh, I'm not certain. Uh, Israel has shown a capability to strike outside of its territory, though it's not usually in drones. But it was like like back in 2011 or 2010, it was with Stuxnet, you know, the one that where they crashed their whole program with a virus. But uh, yeah, it's not impossible. But I just haven't heard about Israel doing much in the way of drone strikes that far away. But then again, that could just be the sign that it's capable of doing that. Devin, uh, I've been sick this weekend. Ah, that sucks. Hope you get better soon and, uh, yeah, have better times. Emil, uh, meh, uneventful, just exams for college. 
I I feel ya. I was there not too long ago. That's almost over four years ago now. Uh, Devin Canada. YouTube delayed, so it came in two minutes late. Ah, okay. Emila, did you hear about the Azerbaijani embassy attack in Iran? Today, the Azeri government, just like the U.S., suspended diplomatic relations and called back their staff and shut down. I have not heard this story. If it's just from today, basically, if the story broke just today, chances are I haven't heard it because I've spent most of today working on a video. Uh, so uh, the next video I've already, you know, like uh, it's already available for patrons to watch is going to be a continuation of the Jewish history series. I'll be covering the uh, period of King Herod. So yeah, that's the continuation of the Jewish history series and that will be coming out Saturday, next Saturday. Yeah. And I've been working on the video following that. So yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm trying to work ahead this year, trying to get further ahead, be further ahead on projects because I am trying a strategy this year to grow the channel and, and it's a, it's a, it's a very niche strategy, but follow me on this, make more videos and publish them on a regular basis. I know crazy, right? But yeah, so that's the part of the uh, content strategy this year is try to put out more videos. And although I can't put out more videos this very moment, I'm hoping that for at least two, for about seven months this year, I'll be able to put out videos on a weekly basis. The plan at the moment is months of uh, March, April, and May, there will be videos weekly. And then September through December, there will be videos weekly with going down to only uh, every other week during the summer months because there's just fewer views coming for educational channels at that time. In which case, I'll use the downtime to try and work further ahead on videos. And there are other plans and surprises coming up this year. Uh, expect some, uh, I guess, expect some uh, interesting or exciting news in March, but I gotta stay hush on that. Uh, six zappy beef. I always found King Herod very interesting. I'll be looking forward to that video. I I hope I can present at least either present information you do not know yet, or at least present the information in an interesting way that you know meshes well with the rest of my Jewish history stuff. Let's see. Uh, Devin Canada is today the day you answer the questions posted on Patreon. Yes, yes, I will answer those questions today. Yeah, so I originally had planned to make a special video just for patrons where I gave them like a state of the channel address and like answered some questions at the end. But because last year and the beginning of this year, I was having a lot of computer troubles, you know, like, like, like at last year, like in the, in the last half of December, like both my laptop and my desktop kind of broke down. And so I had no way of making videos. And then at the beginning of December, my desktop broke down again for another week. And so that delayed things as well. And so this last week, like th just this last week, starting like this last Monday, it was like the first full calendar week that I have had my desktop available to me and my laptop. So everything is back in working order, but it got so late that it's like, okay, I'm just, I'm not going to do this state of the channel dress, but I will answer these questions because people have been asking them. So there are a few people here. I'll catch up on the questions that are sitting here right now, and then I will get to some of those questions because I think some of those are interesting. Emil Husanov, Husanov, Emil, uh, do you do everything alone? Because if so, it would be very stressful and a lot of work. This is a casual historian is a one man operation between research, writing, filming, editing, and then post-production and, you know, promotion, everything, everything is a one-man operation. You know, that's, yeah, everything's a one-man operation here. So I do not have everything. I don't have uh, any assistance at the moment. And I, I can't afford assistance. So, you know, everything has to be a one-man operation at the beginning. 
Shen Partey, you got nothing to ask. Just came here to say hi. Well, hi, Shen Partey. Hope you enjoy your time here, whatever amount of time you spend. All right, so let's get to a couple, to some questions that some of my patrons had, because I think some of you will find them interesting. Uh, over on Patreon, one of the patrons asks, some members of my church fear that the Defense of Marriage Act will lead to eventual persecution of churches. What is your own knowledge on this? And do the members have a legitimate concern? Now, I haven't read the act itself, so I can't speak to certainty. I've read some opinion pieces about it, and from what I say is that I don't think there's anything, there's nothing in the act itself that I think should lead someone to be concerned about religious liberty and you know the uh, freedom and independence of churches. However, that doesn't mean there is aren't reasons to be concerned, and there are valid, legitimate reasons to be concerned because, well... Over the last decade, over the last few decades, we have seen increasing hostility towards traditional, traditionally uh, religious institutions. You know, uh, obviously, a lot of the uh, scandals involving the Catholic Church and sexual abuse has made people very, uh, you know, like between the sexual abuse scandals of the Catholic Church, as well as a lot of like mainstream, uh, you know, evangelical Christians having been very against uh, same-sex marriage and homosexuality for a long time. There is a lot in the growing secularization of American culture in general. There is a fair amount of uh, hostility towards religious institutions. And, you know, people are less upset if bad things happen to people that are unpopular, you know? You know, like... Like, if someone you don't like, like, gets banned off of Twitter, you don't feel as bad. Even if you think what they did should not have gotten them banned off of Twitter, you feel less bad if it's if you think of them as a bad person, you know? Like, Alex Jones. Like, I don't think Alex Jones should have been kicked off of Twitter. Or, and, like, the fact that he was kicked off of all of social media all at once, I think it was bad. But you feel less bad about it because it's Alex Jones, you know? It's that kind of deal, I think, is what a lot of people have with religion, with uh, what might happen to churches. And, of course, like, say what's going on in uh, Colorado. You know, like, uh, the guy with the, uh, you know, the wedding cake guy out in Colorado, uh, Phillips. You know, he, back in the uh, early 2010s, he got sued by a gay couple that wanted them, that asked him to make a uh, cake for their wedding, which... When you read into everything involved in that case, you realize that that wasn't like these were activists. Like they didn't even live in Colorado. They lived in New York and then specifically flew out to Colorado to like to ask this guy to bake a cake just so for the sole purpose of suing him. These are activists. Most of them don't even live in the area. So, yeah, and that guy, of course, is after his, uh, case i think i believe it was a uh, ruled on in 2017 or 2018 the masterpiece cake shop case uh yeah it was either 2017 or 2018 that got ruled on and uh right after that case was settled he got sued again this time by a trans person who was you know trying to make him force him to bake a cake for uh, celebrating their transition well you know, Masterpiece Cake Shop, the owner, did not want to participate in that, and so he got sued again. And so I think churches, I think, have a legitimate reason to be concerned, though I don't think the Defense of Marriage Act itself is the reason for that concern. And so the real concern would end up having to be, you know, it's like, how willing will future administrations be to protect religious freedom? And that is... A very genuine concern but i don't think there's any concerns from the act in and of itself but i am open to persuasion on that let's see uh, emil uh, a business owner can refuse service to you it's totally legal uh, that's the thoughts of a lot of people but there are also instances where you can't or at least you can't refuse service to somebody if they you know, if it's supposed to be for some kind of protected class, you know, like there are protected classes under law where it's like, okay, people, it's like, we need extra protection for these people because there are certain, like there's a time in the United States where like, there was a time in the United States where African-Americans 
could not like conduct commerce in certain parts of the country, you know, because like there were no other alternatives. That's not the case today. But once again, a lot of these, a lot of the cases of, you know, a religious business owner doesn't want to, you know, like conduct business with, you know, a uh, entity for something that they disagree with. Cause like in the Jax Phillips case out, you know, with masterpiece cake shop, the issue wasn't that he wasn't wouldn't serve gay customers at all. It's that he wouldn't make, a wedding cake you know it's like he wouldn't make a wedding cake for a same-sex wedding and of course then in, the, in this newest case is that he would not make a cake celebrating a uh, a trans person's uh transition from one gender identity to another and so you know, there's sort of this idea of like oh he's selectively not choosing and so that's that's gonna have to be litigated in the court and it's probably I mean, Jack Phillips is probably going to win again, mostly because, like, the last time he went to the court, like, the that uh, Colorado uh, Civil Rights Council that's been doing all of this to him has a very well-worn track record of being hostile towards uh, conventionally religious persons. And so, as to re reiterate the question, uh, you know, I don't think the Defense of Marriage Act in and of itself is to be worried about. It's more... The bigger worry is going to have to be whether or not future administrations will be willing to actually enforce its uh, religious protections. Let's see. Uh, all right, before we get to another Patreon question, we'll get to another question here in the chat. Uh, do you think, so yeah, the Justifiner asks, do you think Rick and Morty will continue without Justin Roiland? The show has really declined over the last five to six years. Uh, yeah, yeah. I haven't paid much attention to the show since season four. Yeah, like, a, for me, season three was the high point, and uh, season four felt like a step down, and I've just had no interest in the show since then. And now with uh, Justin Roiland uh, in legal trouble, I think the show is going to continue. They're going to get at least one more season out of it because they're going to try to find, you know, somebody to replace Justin Roiland to, you know, do the voices of, like, well, it's not just Rick and Morty. It's like Justin Roiland voices like half the cast in that show. Half the characters end up being voiced by him. And so I guess we'll end up seeing, you know, it's like because Dan Harmon is also part of uh, Rick and Morty. So I guess we'll see, okay, who were who was the real brains behind the comedy of the show? Will it get better? I mean, there's always this, just the possibility that, oh, Justin Roiland being gone might actually improve the quality of the show, and we have no idea. So, uh, yeah, I think it's gonna get another. It's gonna get another few seasons. Because you're, because once again, like uh, you know, Roiland and Dan Harmon signed a contract with Adult Swim to make those all those uh, episodes, and so they're gonna have to find some way out of the contract. If they don't want to. All right, back to the Patreon. Uh, Scott on Patreon asks, are there any topics you don't feel comfortable talking about or any topic you feel like you can't fully grasp? I know everyone asks for you to cover a certain topic. But is there any you wouldn't want to for some reason, for whatever reason? Uh there are subjects I don't care, mostly because I'm not super interested in them. You know, like, certain issues I don't cover a lot. Uh, I don't cover issues of, like, race and gender. I don't really cover that stuff. Race, gender, sex, I don't cover that stuff very much. Partly because it doesn't interest me that much. But also, it's like, I'm part of the educational YouTuber community. The YouTuber community itself is already fairly progressive much further to the left than I am and the, like the YouTuber community in general is further to the left than I am and the educational YouTuber community is even further to the left than I am and so I don't feel like make needlessly making enemies with people even if I have no personal animus towards any groups or things and so I don't cover it but I also just don't cover it because it's like eh, I'm just not that interested in it to be completely frank you know, I've been a big fan of, like, you know, geopolitics and economics and whatnot for a long time. 
And that's what I'm covering more of nowadays. And so that's what I like to do. So it's mostly out of interest that I don't cover those certain subjects. But also just like pasty white guys are only allowed to have certain opinions about issues like race and, you know, a pasty white guy coming saying, well, Thomas Sowell says X, Y, and Z isn't exactly going to look great to everybody. Even if I think Thomas Sowell is misused and abused by a lot of people. So, uh, yeah, it's mostly race, sex, and gender stuff that I don't cover. And it's mostly because I'm just not super interested in the history. Uh, Emil asks, uh, I would like to know... What are the reasons for the Assad family still remaining in power since 1971, despite being through family issues as well as civil war and destruction of Syria into the Stone Age? Well, the Assad family has survived largely because they have foreign backers that are willing to back them. You know, the Assads, of course, are backed by the Russians and by the Iranians. And, of course, the Assads also have some influence in Syria. In fact, Syria has, not, not Syria, sorry, I mean Lebanon. You know, the Assads, of course, have a lot of influence in Lebanon. You know, and, like, like Hezbollah has fought ISIS. You know, Hezbollah, some Hezbollah fighters were brought into Syria to fight, fight ISIS. So there is that going on. And so I think they are still in power. Simply because they have, they've had a willingness to use levels of force that other dictators were not willing, and they've had outside backers willing to do so, to back them up in it. You know, like fact of the matter is, like they had Russia backing them up. That was that was a big reason why we didn't want to go because it's like because for the same reasons, like the United States isn't you know like sending troops into Ukraine. Is the same reasons we didn't send troops to fight the Russians or to fight Assad directly in Syria. You know, the U.S. troops have been in Syria, but they weren't fighting Assad. They were fighting ISIS. So, yeah, it's mostly, I think, because we don't want a war with Russia. Because even if we could win, it won't be pretty. Uh, Liberty or Nothing says hi. Well, hello there, Liberty or Nothing. Glad to see you in the chat. All right, another question from the Patreon. Uh, Mike asks, Hey Grant, will you be covering the War of the Roses at some point? I've always been a Game of Thrones fan, and I am aware the show draws inspiration from the feud. However, I've never been able to understand the whole thing. Thanks, and keep up the amazing work. Well, Mike, it just so happens that I have actually made a video about Game of Thrones and the War of the Roses. Thrones, War of the Roses. I have a video about that. Let's see if I can find it. Do do do. Yes, I do. So, I'm going to post this video in the chat. Let's see. Come on. Work with me here. There it is. Okay, so back in, I think it's 2019, whenever that last season of Game of Thrones premiered, I made like a 40-minute video in which I compared the plot of the show to the War of the Roses. And so if you're looking for something like that, I have something like that. It's probably lower production quality because I made it like four years ago, but it exists. <laughs> See, a sick zappy beef asks, do you think there could ever be a Kurdish state or is it just too divided and oppressed by different countries for that to happen? I don't think there can be a Kurdish state with the borders of the Middle East as they currently are because it's divided between four different countries at this point. You know, uh, Iraq, Syria, Iran, and Turkey. 
And, uh, well, this is another case where I have made a video related to this. Also from 2019, I think. Yep, just sharing more past videos here. But, uh, yeah. Yeah, I do not think... In the current state the Middle East is in, I do not think you can have a... Uh, independent Kurdish state right now uh, especially because like no individual country is going to let there be a fully independent Kurdish state because it'll you know and not all the Kurdish groups are the same you know because like the Kurds of Turkey are far more aligned with groups like the PKK which are not the greatest groups there you know it's like fact of the matter is the most ideal Kurdish state would be centered around Iraq you know, Mosul and the Iraqi Kurds, but, you know, they've got a pretty good deal at the moment going in Iraq, and they don't need to go fully independent at the moment. Let's see. Uh, Emil asks, do you think Lebanon can be f can free itself from the sectarian divisions, or is it destined to fall into the control of extremists such as Hezbollah? I don't know if it's destined to fall into control by groups like Hezbollah, but so long as there is foreign meddling in Lebanon, I don't think they'll be able to, I don't think the sectarian divides of Lebanon can be mended until the foreign t until the foreign meddling is gone because I think that's a big part of why the they all kind of the sectarian groups have for a very long time not trusted each other is because they see all the other because all of the sectarian groups in Lebanon see the other sectarian groups as being pawns of some foreign power you know like uh you know the the Arabs and the Arab Muslims see the uh, Maronites as basically being puppets of the west and uh, be of the west and of Israel the Maronites see, you know, the uh, see the Sunni Arabs as being puppets of, you know, various Gulf states, and they see the Shia there as puppets of Iran. And so in Le Lebanon, you have this weird mix of like there's a sectarian divide, but the sectarian divide is exacerbated by foreign powers meddling in the region. And so it's going to be something very hard to overcome. All right, let's get another uh, another uh, patron question. Uh, Philippe Garcia asks, as an individual who grew up in a uh, secularist influenced Catholic background, they don't teach us a lot about Luther's life. Now, for example, I didn't even know he got married. So what's the history of uh, Katie Luther? For the uh, Protestant women, for that matter. Oh boy, I am not prepared to answer this question. Uh, so Katharina or Catherine Luther, you know, uh, Luther's wife, uh, was a she was a nun. Who you know, like, and you know Martin Luther and her got married. So you know Martin Luther was a former monk, priest and monk, and. Uh, you know, Catherine, Katharina was a former, you know, uh, nun. That's, I'm afraid I don't have much more to say on that subject right now. Uh, that's, it's worth covering in a video, but there's plenty of books about both of them that you can find. I can recommend at some point when I look into it more. Let's see, uh, all right. I think those are all of the uh, patron questions. So now just all chat. So, uh, Sam Rosenstock, what's your take on Das Kapital? Das Kapital is a really long book that says a lot of nothing. Because, like, there's this weird idea that some people have where it's, like, complicated and smart are, like, synonyms, but they're not. Das Kapital is very complicated. That doesn't make it smart. You know, it's like, intelligence is not, there isn't, like, there is no direct correlation between multisyllabic words and intelligence that, that is not you know that those are not there's no direct correlation there 
Plus, you know, the basic outcome of Das Kapital is basically, you know, it's labor theory of value, which is nonsense. Value is entirely subjective. You know, it's like, that's what, uh, you know, that was just, that was more or less resolved in the late 19th century during Marx's lifetime or just after it. Aditya B asks, how long do you take to complete reading a book? Do you have a method to read history books? Interested to learn how one can consume history books efficiently. So, the way I read history books is that I tend not to read the entire book when I make a video. Now, obviously, depending on the, the video itself, I may read more or less of it. For example, if I'm working on a video where I'm going to be, like, quoting a lot of, like, primary sources, especially memoirs, in that case, I do don't read the whole book. Instead, I read the parts of the book that I need for whatever I'm doing. And so part of that, of course, in the video making process is narrowing the narrowing the topic matter of your video enough so that you can do something like this. So let me pull something out, out from my library to show you. Okay, so right here, I have a Martin Gilbert's Israel, a History. Now, whenever I use this book as a source for some one of my videos, I'm not reading the whole thing. Instead, I will either find the specific chapters I need for a video, or in the back of most books especially like, you know, nonfiction books, there is something called the index. And this is something I did not discover until college. But then again, I didn't have to do much research projects like this in high school. But in the back of most nonfiction books, there will be a section called the index. The index should put place basically all the references in the book and by references i don't mean sources but like every time a book refers to a specific kind of thing like like say if i'm making a video about the lebanese civil war and i need to find stuff about that well i'll go to the back of this book i'll go to the index and look up the segment a part of the index that says lebanon and then it'll show me all the parts of the book that reference lebanon and that's how i was able to make my lebanese civil war series is by all the books I used, I went to the index. Unless they had a whole chapter dedicated to Lebanon, I would go to the index, look up Lebanon, and see all the parts of the book that talk about Lebanon, and then just go to those parts. And that's part of how you can be a bit more efficient when reading. Of course, now that's when reading stuff for, like, say, a project, whether you're doing a research project for school, or in my case, you're making videos. The index in the back of the book is your friend. Now, this can vary, like I said, depending on what the video is about. Like, like for example, when I last year I made a video about Operation Orchard, which was a op, which was a uh, Israeli military operation in 2007, where the uh, Israeli Air Force destroyed a nuclear reactor in Syria. Well, one of the sources I used for that book, one of the sources I used for that series was Shadow Strike. I think it was Shadow Strike. Uh, yeah, Shadow Strike by Yaakov Katz. Shadow Strike, the entire book was about that one event. And so if I'm making a video of, if I am making a video about a thing and I and I find a book that is entirely about that thing, then I typically will read the whole book. But most of the time, most of the books I read don't discuss the whole thing so that's one thing you can do the other thing of course you can do to be more efficient with reading is uh audiobooks audiobooks are your friend i try to uh, now personally i try to uh, if i'm working on a video about a subject i try to avoid watching videos on youtube that are about that same subject mostly because i don't want to find myself repeating all the same stuff or using their analogies and so that is typically what I do. So I say audiobooks and 
the index at the back of nonfiction books are your friend if you want to read history more efficiently for a specific subject. So how long it takes me to read a, to to completely read a book? Nah, I it depends on the length, obviously. And so I don't have I don't have a specific time frame I can give you because rarely nowadays am I reading an entire book for a full video. Liberty or nothing. What future do you see for the Republican Party, especially in 2024? Well, that's going to depend on if Trump, like what happens in 2024, obviously. And I don't know, unfortunately. It's like, it's a real toss up. Because like, I mean, Trump is losing steam in the GOP. You know, he's losing steam, but he's not gone. And DeSantis has a million opportunities has a million opportunities between now and like then to screw things up you know like he could really he could chris christie himself very hard between now and then it's not un, it's not unbelievable that he would, might do that cuz like there are there's cuz the history of american politics is filled with governors who got very popular by opposing the the opposing the president from a, an opposing party and then shot themselves in the foot. You know, that's what happened to Chris Christie. It can happen to a bunch. That's what happened to Chris Christie. That's kind of what happened to like, uh, gosh, that former uh, Scott Walker from Wisconsin. You know, it's like it happens so many it happens so often. Let's see. Uh. All right, looks like some people are chatting up there. Chatting in the comments, that's cool. Okay, uh, Garrett Allen, welcome. Uh, what's your opinion on Messianic Jews? Uh, I remember at my church, which is a Lutheran church, just for anyone who doesn't know that part of my background, uh, there were a, a handful of Jew members of the church who were former Messianic Jews who later just became Christians. And I think... That's the reason why it's like, I remember talking to a local rabbi for a video and they, and that was kind of their view of Messianic Jews. And it's a, it's a very common view, especially among Jews, is that Messianic Jews aren't really Jews. Like, I think a lot of Jews view Messianic Jews as just being Christians. Christians that keep certain Jewish r rituals and that's about it. And I guess, for my opinion, it's like I don't have a problem with them. But once again, I think it depends on like the exact variety of Messianic Jew. Because I'm certain there are multiple varieties that, you know, that manifest in numerous ways. Let's see. Uh, let's see. Uh, Sam Rosenstock. Uh, I know you're asking the question to him, but I'm reading The Wealth of Nations by Adam Smith. Very difficult to read for me, but I'm slowly getting through it. Yep. It's, uh, I have not read, I have not sat down to read The Wealth of Nations start to finish. I probably should at some point, either that or like get an audiobook of it. But, uh, yeah. Yeah, I have not read it myself, but I'm well aware of it. Uh, Mofi Kitty. You lost a lot of weight. Looking good. Well, thank you, MoFi Kitty. Uh, yeah, that was one of my goals of last year, and it's continuing on into the next year. It's uh, health. You know, health has become very important. I'm in my 30s now. you got to be a little more healthy. <laughs> Let's see. Uh, Garrett Allen, uh, the Jews who believe Christ was the Messiah. Okay, so that kind of Messianic Jews. Ah, I think... Once again, I more or less have to agree that they're probably, at this point, if they believe Christ is the Savior, then they're basically just Christians at that point. You know, they're, they're just Christians that put a greater emphasis on, like, Jewish rituals, which kind of makes them, like, apostolic Jews. But I think that's what happens with a lot of Messianic Jews is that a lot of them eventually just convert to a more mainstream version of Christianity. Emil asks, what is your opinion on technocracy? Do you think a technocratic leadership style akin to Hugh Jintao's military government of scientific outlook on development is more desirable? Yeah, it's like technocracies 
The problem with technocracies is that, especially like human run technocracies, I don't think will work because human run technocracies are not as technocratic as they want you to believe it is, you know? Like, obviously, ultimately, technocracies, the definition of technocracies, like the efficient, the idea of a technocracy is worth being, oh, efficient, ruled by the experts. Well, you then have to ask the question, well, who defines what an expert is? And that is where you get run into problems, you know, like, like, uh, like the Soviet Union often like portrayed itself as a technocracy, but like they had, like, there was a long period of time in the Soviet Union where they used very bad science to try and increase like, you know, like agricultural output because the science, this alternative, like understanding of like botany or the you know, agricultural sciences was adopted because, oh, it basically they rejected Mendelian genetics because it was too capitalist or it, like it philosophically lined up with capitalism. And so you get people basically creating an alternative form of genetics that sounds more communist, but it wasn't real. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so... Uh, all right, uh, Didymus, will you talk about the Armenian Genocide? I will at some point. I want to do a video about... Armenian genocide denial, but I have some other topics I want to cover first. So, you know, that's going to be, uh, it'll be, if I, when I cover Armenian genocide, it'll be part of an Armenian genocide denial video. And well, if you're familiar with my history of doing those, they've gotten progressively bigger and longer. You know, like my first video about Holocaust denial was about an hour and 15 minutes. My video about a uh, Holodomor denial ended up being two and a half hours. So, yeah, if I do a video about Armenian genocide denial, it's going to end up being probably at least similar in length to the Holodomor denial videos, if not possibly longer. But we'll have to see there. All right, let's see. Let's see, Anthony Jatt, what is your ancestry? Ah, I am very white, very Western European, you know. Uh, I haven't taken a DNA test myself, but both my parents have, and so it's mostly Western European, you know. On my dad's side, it's mostly, you know, British Isles, you know, uh, English, Scottish, and Irish, you know. And on my mother's side, it's a bit more continental, you know. They have, you know, some, you know, British Isles as well, but they also have, uh, you know, German, French, and a... Uh, surprising chunk of eastern european like a lot more eastern european than i thought but still mostly western european uh didymus what do you find more interest interesting uh ancient greece and rome or the middle ages ah uh, typically i've found like ancient classical history more interesting but I don't tend to study either period very much. Like I've always been more of a modern history guy, you know, uh, you know, Reformation and forward. I've always been more interested in. Liberty or nothing. Have you covered Swiss history? I have not covered Swiss history, or at least not any further than a small tidbit in my video about John Calvin from, I think 2020. Yeah, I did a video about John Calvin, you know, and I stylized him as, you know, like the Ayatollah of Geneva. But otherwise, yeah, it's uh, not covered too much of Swiss history. Garrett Allen, we had a Messianic Jew come to our church when I was young. He became one of our, uh, he became, he became one after reading Isaiah. Yep, that is, Isaiah is one of those books that, you know, people want to talk about, you know, it's like, Saying that Christ is in the Old Testament, that's one of the places you look, you know. The Justifiner. Isn't the European Union a technocracy to a certain extent? All governments are technocratic to one ex to a certain extent. 
He was like, any government that relies on a large number of unelected officials to run it is a technocracy to one degree or another. Just depends on, you know, like, how much authority do those unelected officials have? Because, but otherwise, I think technocracy is just as much an ideology as anything else. Let's see, uh, Six Zappy Beef asks, why don't Jehovah's Witnesses believe in the Trinity? Ah, I'm not sure. I haven't delved too deeply into their stuff. For a lot of Jehovah's Witnesses, I think there's just kind of a lot. It's For them, it's a lot of retreading of older ideas because, like, the Unitarians have been around for a long time. You know, like, Unitarians were around back in the early days of the Christians, or at least a theology that we would say is pretty close to Unitarianism has existed since the very beginning. And so it's just something that comes up again over and over throughout the history of Christianity. I know they have their own, like, parts of the Bible that they cite for this, but I can't name them off the top of my head. Let's see, uh, just a finer. The criticisms being with how the bureaucracy is run from Brussels. Yeah, well, that, that's just also just the nature of bureaucracy. Bureaucracy in general is just every government that runs on bureaucracy has a certain amount of technocracy to it. And so the e so in that case the EU does have some technocratic elements, but not in a way that most governments don't have some amount. Now, liberty or nothing, what's your opinion on the current housing shortage? The current housing shortage is based almost in, is fueled almost entirely by government policy and it's mostly local government policy you know uh and funny enough is that like you you see like a lot of people especially like the neo-urbanist progressives trying to say oh we're we need to fix the housing crisis by getting rid of these evil like the, these evil policy these evil like you know like districting policies these evil policies that you know uh that restrict land usage and it's like completely like either completely oblivious or intentionally ignoring the fact that that uh that land use regulations especially in urban cities were created by progressives in the first place like early 20 late 19th early 20th century progressive movement that was a big part of it was okay it was like industrialization is happening we have these factories spewing smoke and other toxins into the air that are right next to all these apartments and living in areas where people live. And so the idea behind it was, okay, we're going to relocate. We're going to like, we're going to, we're going to tell these business owners that, okay, you can't have your factory here. It has to be in this part of town. We're going to isolate all of the, you know, polluting industries into one part of town. So that way we can keep the other parts of town clean. That was part of the progressive era reforms. And you could argue that it was definitely you could argue that it was necessary, but it's also been really stuck there. And and so basically basically so modern progressives, especially your modern neo urbanist progressives, are now trying to undo one of the problems that their predecessors created. And so most of the things standing in the way of building like basically if you want to want to uh, resolve the housing crisis, there's two ways to do it. We either need to build more houses or people need to adjust how they think they want to live. Because here's the thing, because because like in big cities and big urban areas, rent and like housing prices have gone up skyrocketed. But there are certain parts of the country where housing is is actually fairly cheap. You know, like like infamously, you know, you could go to a city like to places in Michigan and like in Detroit where they have houses that are there for dirt cheap. Now they're fixer uppers, but they're cheaper. The problem, however, is that with the housing crisis, the housing shortage in the U S is that we don't have enough houses in the places where people actually want to live. And so you have two solutions to that. You either need to build more houses where people want to live or make the places 
where housing housing is cheaper, more livable. You know, those are your two options. And obviously, I think the the ultimate option would be to do a little bit of both. You know, but I think I'm yes, I'm not sure which of those will be easier though. Making the unlivable the places where people don't want to live more livable, or making the places that people do want to live easier to find housing. Didymus, would Bosnian genocide denial also interest you? I mean, I'm not uninterested in it, but for one, I think Kraut already did a very interesting video, though that was more directly about, you know, like uh, with uh, Noam Chomsky. And in, th in fact, to be honest, I think I would personally be more interested in making a video about how Noam Chomsky became like this public intellectual in regards to like foreign policy than I am about his beliefs or about like Bosnian genocide denial in general. Cause it's like, how the hell did Noam Chomsky whose expertise and training is as a linguist become a leading author, like become a leading public intellectual, a leading a leading opinion maker about foreign policy. That's just wild to me. And my, I haven't done very deep research into this, but my uh, preliminary, my uh, hypothesis is simply he expressed an opinion that a lot of the media agreed with politically. And so he got promoted that way. And I think it started during Vietnam. But like I said, that's that's a it's a video idea I have, but I don't know when I would ever get around to making it. Uh, Liberty or nothing. I liked your video on Russian capitalism. The whole thing about Russia being ruined because of capitalism isn't entirely true. That's that's the thing. Yes, Russia wasn't ruined by capitalism. The fact matter is, it was ruined by old Soviet ties that refused to die. You know, it's like. There's this this tradition, this narrative you get from a lot of the, uh, you know, the uh, left is that, oh, capital, the capitalists came in and corruption ru run rampant. It's like, uh, no, corruption was in Russia, was in the, so basically the Soviet Union was dominated by corruption for its entire existence. And, you know, it's like basically capitalist, you know, modern post-Soviet Russia is corrupt, is, you know, like it has a lot of corruption and bribery. Because the Soviet Union had a lot of corruption and bribery, and it and the Soviet Union had a lot of corruption and bribery because the Russian Empire was corrupt and briberous. So you know, turtles all the way down. Let's see, uh, Emil, do you have any book recommendations with regards to better understanding geopolitics? Ah. Uh, Geopolitics in the general, not really. Uh, I used to read a lot of this one author, uh, George Friedman. He had founded a company called Stratfor, but I think which has been bought out by another company called Rain, R-A-N-E. I read a lot of his books. His books got like influenced a lot of my thinking on it, though I've been rethinking some of that in recent years. But, you know, uh, look up an author called George Friedman. Uh, he's had some interesting books, you know, uh, one called The Next Decade. I've actually wanted to make a book, a video about for a while or another book he wrote called The Next Hundred Years. It's interesting stuff, but I've been having to rethink it myself recently. So, no, I don't have any specific books on geopolitics, unfortunately. Let's see. Uh. What still asks when Joseph Smith founded Mormonism, he did the same thing to the Christians. Paul did to the Jews, right? I'm not entirely certain because like, uh, like St. Paul, a big part of what St. Paul did was differentiate Christians from Jews, you know, like, cause there's a reason why like say black Hebrew Israelites, especially the ones that are far more Judaic centric, will sometimes exclude St. Paul's writings from the New Testament from their own scriptures. 
And Joseph Smith didn't exclude Christian writings from Mormon texts. He just added a lot of extra stuff. So I don't know if it's a perfect analog. Uh, Dev in Canada, my problem with housing is we need to treat housing as a necessity and not a commodity. Now, I'd actually challenge that bit there because I don't, in fact, I'd say the problem with housing isn't that we're treating it as a commodity. In fact, I think we need to treat it more like a commodity because it's like basically the issue with housing right now is that we treat it as an investment rather than a commodity. Because see, if it was a commodity, it's something that you would build a lot of. Because if you need to build more of it, build a lot of it. Because people are buying and selling it all the time. But if you're treating it as an investment, then there is an incentive to make less housing built. Because if there are more houses built, then the value of your home becomes less because, you know, general supply and demand. You know, it's like the supply of a good goes up. The Generally speaking, the value of the other pre-existing goods will go down. So, in fact, I think we could actually solve the housing crisis more if we treated housing more like a commodity. Uh, I think maybe Polymatter made a video about this a little while ago. Uh, let's see, I think Polymatter Japan Houses. It's like, yeah, so Polymatter a little while ago, like, like about two weeks ago, published a video called why Japan is giving away 8 million free houses. And there are more and there's more to it than just, you know, the fact that they treat it like a commodity, but I think that is an important element. So here in the chat I'm going to share his video. And I think that'll give a little more uh, understanding as to why I think we we should treat housing more like a commodity because right now we don't treat it like a commodity, we treat it like a long-term investment. But there are ways, but people can disagree on how we interpret this. So yeah, Dev in Canada, we should also take away power from homeowners associations, such as their ability to put a lien on a home for frivolous reasons. I haven't done enough research into homeowners associations to fully, uh, to have a full opinion about it. My only, my preliminary thought on them is simply you should have the right to leave a homeowners association. You know, it's like basically a homeowners association. This should not be tied to the home. It should be tied to an individual signing a contract. You know, it should be tied to a person, not the home. That would be my preliminary thought on it. See, uh, six zappy beef. Didn't Noam Chomsky also deny the Cambodian genocide. That's what I've heard. I haven't done enough reading to know that for certain, but I've heard stuff like that. Basically, I've heard that Noam Chomsky tends to deny genocides that are uh, blamed on communist regimes. It's like if a communist regime is blamed for a genocide, he tends to question or deny it. Liberty or nothing? Thoughts on the coming recession? You know, uh, you know, recessions are like winter, you know, they're always coming. It's just a matter of when. And it might not be like other recessions, but then again, you know, because like, because like when we were facing recession earlier, it was a very different recession because it's like, yes, the economy sh either shrank or wasn't growing very fast. But we also had very low unemployment. So that's just. So a recession can happen, but can also be an unusual recession. So we have no idea. I, you know, just as someone who came of age during, you know, the uh, Great Recession back in 2008, 2009, you know, uh, I was in high school at that time, graduating high school and going into college. That was a crappy time to be a young person looking for work. So, yeah, I don't want to see stuff like that happen again. Uh, Bad Glue asks, does one leopard tank equal one Spartan? No idea. I am not a tank guy. I talk as little as possible about military history. I might talk about broad military movements when I cover, like, geopolitical stuff. 
but I never get into the details of like weapon specifications because that stuff kind of bores me. Ah, the Justifiner. In California, there are a lot of building restrictions, correct? Due to people wanting to keep their property values up. Uh, yes, that happens a lot. That especially happens a lot in the very affluent communities. Especially a lot of the affluent communities along the coast. That happens a lot. And, of course, the affluent communities, of course, is where a lot of people want to move because there's money there. Which means there's probably good work there. But keeping, you know, it's like not building more houses, not building apartments or sky rises and whatnot prevents people from moving to the places where there is money to be made. So yeah, just finer. I believe there was a law passed where an average citizen can sue any land developer with little standing, keeping construction costs high. Yes, uh, the law you're referring to is one related to like environmental impacts so you know it's like anybody you know uh yeah so anybody in california can sue a developer who's trying to develop land on grounds that it's going to have a negative environmental impact in which case it'll delay construction for a very long time and that in Cal and that is what gets used in california a lot to stop construction so, yeah, yeah, California can uh, be kind of screwy like that. Let's see, any more questions I can find? Do, 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 do. All right. Let's see. Yeah. All right. We're going for about a. Uh... Hmm. All right. Uh, anybody have any more questions? We've been at this for uh, just over an hour now. Any more questions? Okay. I uh, got what sell. Christianity isn't a sect of Judaism. The New Testament was added to the Jewish Bible, like the Book of Mormon to the Christian scriptures. Oh, okay. So this is response to a question before about Joseph Smith. And yes, it's like it's once again, Mormonism, this, I think a lot of this depends on like comparing Joseph Smith to Paul and this has a lot to do with whether or not you view Mormons, Mormonism as being Christians. And that is a question that is fraught. It's, it's a history with a, it's a big question that's very loaded among Christians and I view Mormonism in two different lights. There's Mormonism as a historical, like as a historical movement, as a historical group and movement, and then Mormonism in a theological sense. So when I look at Mormonism as a historical movement, I view them as Christians in a historical sense, but I do not view them as Christians in a theological sense. And that would be my view on that. So I think... What you're asking, say, is more is Paul is Joseph Smith to Christians what St. Paul was to Judaism. In a theological sense, I would agree with you, but in a a uh, historical sense, I would say no. Uh, Guy asks, "What media sources do you trust to get fair and honest reporting?" What? Let's see. Fair and honest reporting. Uh, well, I don't, you know, so here's something you're going to find funny. I don't actually read the news that much. I don't read the, I don't have much in the way of direct news sources. I read, I read some from like uh foreign affairs, you know, which is a, uh, you know, a uh, international relations publication. You know, I read some stuff from that, but otherwise I get most of my news from listening to podcasts. And I listen to a lot of like a uh, conservative podcast in particular, like, the Dispatch, you know, like uh, The Dispatch, uh, Jonah Goldberg's outfit. Let's see here. Let me pull up my list of podcasts that I listen to. And so, 
it comes to the podcast I listen to there, I get news from uh, The Remnant with Jonah Goldberg, one of the dispatch podcasts. It's not strictly a news podcast, but it's a podcast where I get news stories from. And I tend to rely on them, or at least I rely on a lot of the dispatch podcasts for like filtering out what news is worth my time and what isn't, you know? Because like there's a lot, because like you can get, because there are a lot of news podcasts podcasts out there that'll give you a kind of just a lot of whatever is trending, but I tend to wait for like oh it's like that I I allow these podcasts to filter out what is probably unimportant news, and so uh, the remnant with Jonah Goldberg, advisory opinions, the Dispatch podcast itself. I also listen to the editors from National Review, so. Those are ones I do. Uh, I used to watch Philip DeFranco, but I haven't watched him in a couple years, so I can't say what he's like. Uh, I stopped watching him probably around the time of January 6th because he just kind of got really annoying. But yeah, I don't have mu too much negative to say, at least based on what I last viewed, but I haven't watched Philly D in a while, so I can't say how he's doing lately. Let's see, uh, Liberty or Nothing, uh, your opinion on Kirk Wilcox? Uh, Kirk Wilcox, he is a, uh, a Randian, an Ayn Randian objectivist guy. Uh, yeah, he's a, a cool guy. I think, you know, I've, 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 I've done a, done a live stream with him before, you know. We chat on Twitter, you know, it's like, it's, that's yeah, cool. Nothing wrong with the guy, you know. Yeah, that, that's all I really have to say. We're friendly. Six Sappy Beef asks, what direction do you think Turkey will take if Erdogan is voted out in the upcoming election? I'm not sure. I haven't taken a deep enough look into Turkey's politics to see what the possible other options are. And I see you're spelling Turkey uh, <laughs> the new way, the way Turkey's been telling people to spell their country's name. I have not spelt it that way because why? <laughs> But, uh, yeah, no, I don't know enough about Turkey's politics to give a guess as to what direction they might be moving in. Let's see. Uh, Alex Wilkie, is it wrong to think Nixon was a weirdo? Nixon was a bit of a weirdo. You know, uh, there's, there's especially the story of, you know, like... Uh, he and his wife, where basically Nixon uh, asked his future wife out be long before they were married. She said no. And then she was dating another guy. And you know what Nixon did was a uh, young Richard Nixon served as a chauffeur for the girl, for the woman, for the girl he asked out that rejected him. And so he would serve as a chauffeur for her and her dates he did this for a while and like yeah, that's 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 a level of weird that's a level of weird and creepy and desperate you know i, I think the kids nowadays would call that a simp they call him a simp for that but uh yeah yeah he's a little weird though based on one autobiography i've been listening to on audible about him it sounds like nixon had he not gotten into politics or the law may have actually would have probably been a pretty good historian See a guy. Uh, thank you. I never miss Victor Davis Hanson's podcast. Uh, I don't think I've heard of Victor Davis Hanson, but I might look into that. Nixon was a strange guy, Liberty or nothing. He very much was a strange guy. Real weirdo there. Do, 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 do. Let me see here. Any questions in the Discord? Let me look. All right, no questions in the Discord. Nothing left on the Patreon. Yep, it's all back to you guys. Let's see. Are organized practice religions in ascendancy or decline? Now, there's some interesting uh, statistics you can look at for stuff like this.
Like, uh, for example, like one of the largest uh, denominations in the United St- Christian denominations in the United States is the uh, Southern Baptist Convention. And when you look at some of these statistics, you find that the Southern Baptist Convention is shrinking. But the reason it's shrinking isn't because people are leaving the faith. The reason the Southern Baptist Convention is shrinking is because individual congregations are splitting off from the church because they want to go in a more uh, apostolic direction. So, like, yeah, like there's a lot of uh, a lot of a lot of uh, Southern Baptists are becoming more apostolic. I like like basically, uh, you know, like care. They're becoming a lot more apostolic or charismatic Christianity, and so I think that's one of the issues we have is that there is we're seeing a rise in charismatic Christianity, and one of the issues with charismatic Christianity is that charismatic Christianity tend to, tends to be very congregationalist, as in, as in like they're not part of wider denominations. Like they are a denomination. Consi- they are all denominations consisting of a single congregation. And so that's what we're finding. We're finding traditional uh, evangelical congregation, the like denominations are breaking down into individual congregations. So, and that, and at that point, it becomes harder to like collect data on them. And so, what I'm finding is that I think the traditionally religious are becoming more organized, but the traditionally irreligious are becoming almost more like uh what's the word uh uh superstitious in a way having their own sort of like secular superstitions see liberty or nothing uh i hear people say nixon had a good foreign policy and now i want to know what your thoughts are on it nixon had pieces of good foreign policy you know he had pieces of good foreign policy but he also had stuff like you know bombing cambodia you know like nixon like i think like a lot of presidents was a mixed bag you know it was a mixed bag i think breaking china away from the soviets was a good thing but then again china was already you know, drifting away from the Soviets before Nixon, you know, opened up China. Basically, Nixon took advantage of something that was already there rather than creating it. Alex Wilkie, do you think do you think paganism was dealt a bad hand when parts of the world were converting into other religions like Abrahamic faiths? I think. I think pagan religions, uh, pagan religions, especially the pagan religions of Europe, were just like, they were religions that you had no reason to convert to. You know, like Christianity and Islam have sort of like, they have like evangelical drives, you know, drives to convert people to the religion, you know, like, but the Olympian gods were not, the Olympian gods did not tell the Greeks or you know, did not tell uh, the Hellenist world to, you know, go and make worshipers of other people. Because, like, what the Greeks and Romans usually did was when they what, when they came upon a place that had a different religion from them, what they usually did was say, oh, these people worship the same gods as us. They, they just called them different names. And that was their approach. And so basically they had this universalist approach where it's like, oh, all religions are just the same. But then you have monotheism, which is basically, you know, like, no, there is only one God and it's ours. And so I think that was kind of like, basically, I find the more open you are to changing what gods are and are not real, the less likely your religion is to survive. That's one of the reasons why I think Judaism was able to survive so for so long. It's one of the reasons I, why I think Christianity and Islam were able to grow. Is because, you know, if you're willing to accept the existence of other gods, you know, bringing in more gods isn't a problem. And eventually you can just give up those other gods. See, uh... Venacity. 
What is your opinion on the gold standard? I used to be a gold bug. I used to be a gold bug guy, and I still think there's a... I still think there is a uh, use for it, but I am not as gung-ho on it as I once was. Like, basically, I just don't think a gold standard can be restored. Not It's not that I don't think it'll work. It's that I think too much is based around not having it. But, uh, yeah. Yeah, I used to be far more gung-ho on gold. Tyson Clark, who answers your questions? Me. Bad glue says unglued. All right, then. <laughs> Liberty or nothing. Honestly, as an irreligious guy, there's a part of me that wants to get involved in religion. Uh, yeah, it's like, I'd say find one. I, of course, always encourage Lutheranism because it's the correct one. <laughs> If I do say so subjectively myself. <laughs> uh, Sino-Soviet split was bound to happen. You are right. Uh, bad glue. Bricks and mortar churches are expensive. Uh, they are, but they also look very nice. They're also very pretty. Especially when done properly. And they have an actual altar rather than something on wheels that they move in and out. The, uh, the Justifiner, lots of self-proclaimed secular folks really are superstitious, like interest in crystals and calling objects spirits or spiritual. Let's see. Uh, yeah, that's it's like like something you've seen in like something you see in the last number of years is that like a growing number of people who believe or take astrology very seriously. Well. Astrology is basically just secular superstition. As in the modern world, astrology is basically just secular superstitions. Let's see, uh, Didymus. What do you make of the comparison between capitalism and feudalism? I would say, like, whose comparison? Because, like, Marx himself even said that you know capitalism was a step above feudalism because it even had it even it had more freedom you know it took you know it was like it democratized more but of course that was also part of marx's idea of you know the inevitable progress towards communism you know it's like capitalism was more you know ca capitalism was more freeing was more like freed people more than feudalism and socialism would free people more than capitalism than communism would free more than socialism or so on and so forth So, uh, yeah, it just depends on which one you're thinking of, I guess. Uh, liberty or nothing? Hey, I'm open to learning and possibly converting. Mm -hmm. Very nice. Uh, if you're interested in learning, I'd suggest, uh, at least for my specific brand, I'd say look up a YouTube channel called Lutheran Satire. If you, if you find that funny, you might like Lutheranism. Let's see. Sick Zappy Beef, what do you think of Malcolm X? See ya. Hold on a sec. Uh, History and Headlines is in the chat. I have to head to sleep now since I teach in the morning. Best wishes for 2023. You too. History and Headlines, have a good night and good week. Good, good new year. All right, back to you, Sick Zappy Beef. What do you think of Malcolm X? Ah, uh, well, Malcolm X, let's say, mo for a big chunk of his career, he was very much like, uh, well, he was, Malcolm X was kind of racist for a chunk, for a good chunk of his career. He was like, he started to turn things around towards the end, but then he got assassinated by a, a you know, member of the Nation of Islam. Yeah, need to learn more about Malcolm X. I've I know the general like I know the general like pattern of his life, but I can't say much more than that. It's just he started turning things around towards the end. 
Alex Wilkie, what do you think of 1940s era Republican figures like Thomas Dewey, Wilkie, Howard Taft, or Arthur Vandenberg? I don't know much about Arthur Vandenberg. And a lot of the Republicans at that time, especially leading Republicans, were kind of like, for lack of better words, New Deal Republicans. You know, like they're Republicans who agreed with a lot of uh, a lot of the New Deal. Yeah, and like even like someone like uh, like uh, Taft, like Senator Taft, like he gets portrayed as being like like especially among like among paleo conservatives as like oh he was this non-interventionist. It's like and they talk about like oh like he didn't want America to be in NATO. And it's true, like you know, Senator Taft didn't want America to be join NATO. But that was because he wanted America to form, like, a NATO of the Pacific Ocean. You know, it's like, basically, it wasn't that he was against America being involved in foreign alliances against the Soviet Union. It's that he thought the bigger threat right, and the higher priority should have been the, the uh, Asia-Pacific region rather than the North Atlantic. And the only reason, like, say, in fact, one of the only reasons Eisenhower became president was because, like, he and, like, Senator Taft talked about it once and he basically like he had talked to Taft like okay and they're basically they, Taft and Eisenhower agreed on everything except NATO you know it's like Eisenhower was a big supporter of NATO and Taft wasn't and that was his uh, sole reason for coming in so yeah Devin Canada good night I have to work tomorrow may the Lord be with you and may the Lord be with you Devin Canada great having you around and uh, hope to see you more in the future. Wait still. Perhaps Joseph Smith was like Martin Luther too. In a historical sense, kind of. Except I don't think... Except Joseph Smith did not usher in nearly as big a movement. He did not usher in nearly as big a movement as uh, Martin Luther did. But uh, yeah... Yeah, perhaps a more similar to that, but still not nearly the same degree. Gavino Twiggy Fuentes. Hey, love your channel. Any collabs coming up? Malcolm X or Marcus Garvey would be cool. I might look into them at some point, but I don't see anything like that. Uh, any collabs coming up? Uh, no collabs in the way you're thinking coming up. I mentioned earlier in the stream that there are some developments happening behind the scene that will probably be revealed in March, but I'm gonna. Have, but I can't. Uh, I can't get any to any specifics about that. Alex Wilkie, what do you think of the U.S. presidency being turned into a uh, diarchy between the president and vice president? Uh, I don't think it's. Don't think it's necessary. Plus. You know, it's like you're basically, or I'm not even sure what you mean by diarchy. I don't, I don't think I've heard that term. If I've had to guess what that term would mean, it's like, yeah, I'm not even sure what that term is supposed to mean. So let me see if that's a word that exists. First of all, diarchy. Government by two independent authorities. Okay. So. I wouldn't call it a diarchy, but, you know, I also don't think that's a good idea. Because, like, I would say look at, like, Roman history and the history of, like, the consuls of Rome, you know? It's like, the idea behind the Roman government, or the or the old Roman Republic, is that, you know, oh, you have, you have split power between two men. It's like, oh, don't worry. It's like, each one can cancel the actions of the other out, but having the two men there usually just very it led to a lot of civil wars and so probably not the best idea liberty or nothing what are your thoughts on the antifa riots going on i wasn't aware of any antifa riots going on right now like and as i said earlier if this is news from today i probably will not have heard of it simply because i have been I've had my face buried in a computer all day working on a video about events going on in the 1960s. <laughs> so I won't have any uh, yeah, knowledge of that. 
justifying her. The vice president still has very little power, to be honest. Very little power. The vice president only has as much power as the president lets them have. Which is the same with basically all, like, cabinet-level officials. They only have as much power as they're allowed to. Let's see. Uh, apparently there are riots going on in Atlanta, perhaps. And uh, I have no thoughts on it because I have no idea what's actually going on. So, yeah. <laughs> Yeah, being conservative with your willingness to comment on events is part of the way of being right all the time. You know, it's like, if you don't say anything about it, you can't be wrong. <laughs> but yeah, not familiar with riots going on right now by Antifa or otherwise. Let's see here. Do, 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 do. All right, I think we're going to go for a few more minutes and then uh, call it a night. Any more questions before we uh, close out this evening? Let's see, Fantas Let's see, Frangi, opinions on Greater Ohio? I think Greater Ohio would make Western Oregon happy, but I don't think it would make the rest of Oregon happy. Because they like having mountains. Yes, Greater Idaho does look like a giant middle finger. <laughs> See, uh, Justifiner, do you think you will ever move to the Midwest or the South? If I move to the South, it'll either be Texas or Florida, and I don't see myself moving to the Midwest. Didymus, thoughts on Atun Shea? I like his videos. Not a fan of his politics, but, you know, you can separate those things, even though for him they don't get separated in the point. But, you know, I, I really appreciate Atun Shea's, like, creativity you know, his, uh, I respect his craft and like a lot of funny stuff, you know, you know, Checkmate Lincoln Knights is really good. And I find very, I find little to object to in Checkmate Lincoln Knights. See, Liberty or nothing. I like living in more quiet places. I love the Midwest. Uh, there's some nice things about it, but. I'm a California boy, and as much as I hate the heat, I don't know if I would want to live in the snow. Six Zappy Beef, thoughts on knowing better? It's either hit or miss with him. Same thing for me. Uh, knowing better is uh, either hit or miss. He's been more miss for me lately, but I can say I don't think I've watched his last several videos, mostly because I think I could probably guess what they are going to say before he says it. Because he's kind of predictable. Because, like, let me see, let me see his channel. It's like, let's see if I can actually see name the last video he published that I actually watched. I think the last video he published that I actually watched was the one about Starship Troopers. The rest of them are just, you know. Fairly predictable. You know exactly what he's going to say in each and every one. So, yeah. <laughs> All right. Uh, Liberty or nothing. Uh, do you do these streams often, by the way? I'm kind of new to the channel. Ah, well, my history of doing streams is rather spotty. You know, it's like, but this year, I'm hoping to do them a bit more consistently. I'm going to try to do at least one stream a month, usually towards the end of the month. So we'll see how that works out. Like I said, I originally had planned this to be like the streams to be the last Thursday of each month. But, you know, this Thursday, this week just had day after day where I had to delay the video for one reason or another. But I'm hoping in future months for the rest of this year... 
that the last Thursday of each month will be a live stream. So yeah, that is the intent behind it. Gavino Twiggy Fuentes, how much was the uh, util utilitarian church involved? I think I think you meant to spell it the uh, Unitarian Church involved in U.S. history. Ah, the Unitarian the Unitarians have had probably a disproportionate uh, impact on American history because a number of U.S. presidents were Unitarian. Whereas, say, uh, my church, the Lutherans, did not have a huge impact on the wider country. Though I would say the Lutherans, what the Lutherans do have, however, is an underappreciated role in, like, the, uh, in the private school, in the history of, like, private schooling in the U.S. They have an underappreciated history. And the people who try to say, oh, private schools were all solely founded to, like, to try and uh, continue Jim Crow after, you know, like, the after the Civil Rights Act, completely ignore, like, the pre-existing history of, like, Catholic and Lutheran parochial schools. So, yeah, that's, uh, you know, that's a thing. Opinion of cynical historian? A uh, cynical historian, Cypher, is a friend of mine. I I watch most of his videos. I don't. I ha, I typically have more disagreements with his modern work than his older work, but still, you know, he's a he's a friend of mine. You know, I've I've got his I got his number on my phone. You know, we're, we're buds. So yeah, yeah, I get along with the dude. Let's see. All right. Well, we are about the, uh, we just passed the 90 minute mark here. So I think I'm going to call that it for the evening. Thank you all so much for, uh, for coming to the stream. And I hope to do another one of these streams next month. The last Thursday of, uh, March will be the, uh, sorry, the last Thursday of February. I hope to be the next stream day. And based on my calendar, that is uh, the 23rd of March should hopefully be another uh, stream day if I continue the uh, last Thursday of the month schedule that I had intended. So yeah, February 23rd should hopefully be the next stream. And the next video is going to come out next Saturday. So that is uh, February 4th. February 4th is when the uh, King Herod video will be coming out. But if you are a member of the Casual Historian Patreon, that video is available to watch right now. So, thank you all for coming by, and I will see you next time.